And we are live. Okay. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to Holy Humanist. Um, this is a very last minute live stream, but it is so, so, so worth it. I have a very special guest with me today, and it, she's part of the force of women, and we're here to tell our stories, and we're here to dissect Islam and everything surrounding it. So yeah, without further ado, I'd like to introduce one godless woman. Um, she is a fearless, incredible woman, which we will get to know a lot more about her during the duration of this stream. But um, yeah, I'll also plug her YouTube, but let me call her into the stream. Welcome. <laughs> How are you? Good, good. Thank you. How are you? I'm very grateful to be here and thank you so, so much for having me. Thank you very much for being here. I know you're traveling um, as am I, but this is amazing that we've been able to connect and I'm just so excited to have you here. Um, just before we get started, I want to plug your channel. Um, give me a sec. So this is One Godless Woman's YouTube channel amazing I've been watching her videos as well so you're saying you've been active for about three years on YouTube right I have been and if anyone is interested in any special content or exclusive content I also have a locals that you're welcome to follow with the same name okay, a local awesome. so guys please go and check out this channel subscribe um there's some amazing content on here i'm literally just always browsing through your videos i love the <laughs> topics you. i love your spontaneous videos as well when you're like listen the weather's good i'm here <laughs> i have stuff to say <laughs> um, listen yeah so how else can people we can't sometimes like i do a lot of scripted my big videos are scripted but every now and then we have to have a little bit of free flow it's important. hundred percent. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. So besides um, that, how how else can people follow you? What what social media platforms are you active on? Well, I'm basically on everything. Although YouTube, hopefully, if they don't ban me, I'll remain there. But you're welcome uh, to follow me there. I'm also on uh, Rumble, as well as Locals, which is another really, really, really good one. Locals is good because it sort of amalgamates everything. It's like a Facebook, a Twitter, a YouTube, all in one. So awesome. rather than scattered everywhere, and then people can subscribe to you, people can donate to you. It's really good for people like us because we are ex-Muslim women, constantly targeted by big tech. Yeah. And our, you know, our viability and our ability to make an income is constantly being affected. Yeah. So locals definitely protects you from all of that. Okay, amazing. Yeah, so everyone who's watching, definitely go check out One Godless Woman on Locals. Definitely subscribe to YouTube as well. There's there's amazing content. Um, and okay, I'm just so excited because um, <laughs> we've just recently connected, but I feel like we have a lot of kind of overlap between our stories and just our general life experiences and where we are now. Um, so I guess for my viewers who kind of are just new to you, completely have no understanding of who you are, what your story is, just want to give a quick rundown of your background. And then the plan is, guys and girls, for today, it's kind of just a free-flowing conversation. We're just going to chat for an hour, see where the conversation goes. Um, but we will be doing a lot more of this. So Absolutely. yeah. You can um, take it away. <laughs> not much different from you. <laughs> I was born in England. Uh, I was born in Westminster. And I lived there until the age of nine. Just like you. <laughs> nine is that, is that pinnacle it of a number? That, <laughs> you know why they move us by the age of nine. I know you do. Mm -hmm. You know why? Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> in Islam. Yeah. 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 Yep. It's that magical number in Islam when things start yeah, to it's change. It's when a woman becomes a woman, right? Nine yeah. years old. Yeah. yeah. So moved to Saudi Arabia, but mm -hmm. unfortunately for me, I wasn't. Um, I was located. I was relocated into a very hostile part of Saudi, which is Riyadh. Riyadh mm -hmm. is essentially the Wahhabi central, uh, Salafi central part uh, of Riyadh, and I was not. I basically lived with locals not off-site, yeah. uh, not in a protected area. Uh, yeah. So yeah, that was interesting. It was a very interesting experience. 
Yeah, I and am... even just that, like, I have so much to just stop you on because no, I know, like... <laughs> no, ask. Let's get into it. Come on. Okay, let's do this. So, for example, so I was in Jeddah and we had, like, the, the remnants of smaller factions of what happens in Riyadh, right? So we'd have, like, the yeah. Mutawa, we'd have, um, the like, compound life, and then outside life was so different. Like, I would see those individual villas and be like oh my god what would life be like for people in that because the only reason I'm okay is because I have a pool I've got friends I can drive maybe not cars but I could like mess around on bikes and quad bikes here without getting you know yes. my my bum whipped by the Saudis exactly. or whoever and I would feel for that and we'd all, all we'd hear is like rumors of chop chop square and how things were just so chop, much chop worse square. in Riyadh yeah you know, well, I was a fantasy, like, right? I'm not making this up when I tell yeah. people that. The interesting thing here that I would like to, to bring to surface as a contrast for your viewers, when we do these live streams, it's important for people to, to dive into the little gems that are disclosed. You lived, thankfully, and I'm very happy that you did not suffer. In, in Saudi Arabia and that you were protected in a compound and that you had some freedom. I'm so happy for you, my dear. Unfortunately, other women, including women like myself, had a very different experience. So yeah. because we had no freedom, we yeah. wanted it so bad. So what I discovered was a compound similar to the place that you, you lived in. in. In Riyadh, it was called the diplomatic quarter or the right. DQ. And that was my outlet because I had a British passport and uh -huh. Saudi, uh, Saudi nationals couldn't enter the DQ, but I could, right? So mm -hmm. that's when I would go and have my fun. <laughs> yeah. It's ironic as well that both of us hold the same passports and that's effectively what in some weird way saved us or put us into more of a, a, a problematic scenario at a certain point. But okay, so it, it just just kind of level with me in the sense that I just want to get a little bit of pic of a picture of what that was like when you found the DQ. So is okay. it similar to my compound setup where there's people from all across the world? We had American military living there, yes. um, and effectively anything goes right. People are brewing their own uh, wine at home. There's parties. There's women in bikinis. It's just it's me really in Saudi. Who would believe that? I Who know. I know. But yeah, drugs, how you booze, want. everything. Yeah, pork. Yeah. So in the DQ, I would go to have sex. That's where I would go to drink. That's where I would go to meet boys and men. That's where I would go to dance. That's where I would go to live as a teenager. Yeah. Now, no. yeah. And unfortunately for me, it was a very short lived period of time. And it was highly stressed by fear because when we would go into the diplomatic quarter, the religious police's GMC would be standing outside waiting. Oh, to my God. <laughs> so you know what we would do? We would hide the women, oh the girls. We would duck in the truck and then the guys would go into the, into the DQ and they wouldn't see us. And on the yeah. way out, we would do the same. Do you and know? Do you have your abaya ready for the Everything. truck ride home? And Everything. The, yeah. Every, yeah. The costume. <laughs> the costume is there. It's ready. <laughs> it's Halloween. You know? Yeah. yeah. Now, you, what was it like for you in your compound? You could go out, have fun in the compound, but it was, you knew you were protected. Or did you have fear? Like, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. So it's it like you, the exact fear that you're describing when you're getting that costume on and you're ducking in the truck, that would be my life literally until you reach the security gates of the compound. So yeah. to and from school, you're on a public bus from the compound. And anywhere you're going out in Jeddah, you're taking the like the limousine, they called it, of the compound, but the car yeah. sanctioned by the compound because you don't want to get into random taxis. And if you go with anyone else's drivers, God forbid there's boys in the car, you have to duck, you have to hide under the seats, all of that nonsense, even to get into your own compound, like fool the security, just yeah. to kind of bring your friends in to hang out with you after school. So that fear was always there, but thankfully it was left at the gates of the compound, which... 
obviously you had constantly around you and constantly in the back of your mind and yeah. that dq was pretty much your only escape if i'm not wrong it was, right? but it was worth every minute <laughs> i'm sure it was <laughs> I'm so sure it was. I remember being so shocked, like, even when I lived in the compound and I would see, like, I, I, I was, like, still a believing Muslim at this point and I was way too young to be, like, heavily involved in drinking and stuff. But I'd see, like, my European friends and my American friends and their families were actually, like, missing home so much but trying to abide by these Saudi rules. So they'd, like, one of my friend's dad would spend, like, six months of year trying of the year trying to brew his own beer and trying to brew his own wine and I was like you go to this much effort just for like yes. that little bit of enjoyment but you do it pushes you to the fringes it does it does and there is there is a fear that is mixed in with joy with joy and and almost excitement I'm doing something that I could literally be killed beheaded yeah. but I'm still doing it yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's an adrenaline rush like no other. <laughs> it's incredible, and this is this this is the defiance that that we develop that a lot of people here in the West cannot understand. Tell me how you felt moving to a freer Middle Eastern country. Tell me how you how you perceived it. Honestly, like when I would even go from like. Jeddah to Dubai just for a vacation in the middle of when I lived there it was like you know just midway on the plane like the abaya comes oh, off and you're like <laughs> literally like Tah. I am like free now at least okay I'm in a Muslim country I was still believing but I was like this is perfect this is like a nice balance of east meets west because mm. yes I hear the call to prayer and I get the the holidays for Ramadan like the timings all change according to me if I'm fasting but I'm not forced to wear this abaya. I can meet a guy in a restaurant and, you know, all hell's not going to break loose. In yeah. Saudi Arabia, like even walking to a restaurant and there being guys in the group was so like, you're constantly looking around. Your peripheral really? vision is like, is there mutawa? What's the scene? Like, is this mall like too out there? Is this too patrolled? And I remember once I actually was walking with one of my Australian friends and thankfully he had longer hair from the back and the Mutawa were walking around but they just saw us like passing in the back and I was like Bradley you actually look like a woman right now just keep walking let's get out of here and it was all okay but oh, honestly wow. you're so scared and you know at that time like you're you're kind of growing up you're trying to do live a normal let's say teenage life um yeah. And you're forced into this weird like shell of a person and you're forced into this weird segregation that you're not, it doesn't come naturally. No. Um, so that, I, I understand how much the DQ must have meant for you because those nights that I would sit by the pool and you could sit girls and guys together, just that tiny yeah. freedom felt like everything in a world, in a place like Saudi. Exactly. I thank you for saying what you just said. That touched my heart. And uh, I just wanted to show your audience talking about Saudi and the. Do you, do you have that picture I sent you? I, I just I do. Let me pull it up for you. Actually, I wanted to show your audience. Now I don't know where. How is it where you are? Because this is the picture she you're gonna pull up is uh, is interesting because that's from where I'm at in Canada. Okay, this is what Iman is talking about, guys. This guy, what do you guys think of this guy? What do you think of his mask? Tell me. <laughs> what are your thoughts? Does it remind you of anything? It it literally reminds me of my days at school in Saudi because we all had that tied to our backpacks. Can you believe it? Really? <laughs> oh yes, my god. At one point, like people did. But well, yeah, please enlighten, enlighten so everybody. This, What's going on? This piece of work. This fascinating thing that you see in front of you is the transport. Uh, sorry, yes, he's the transportation minister in Canada. He, wow. uh, uh, he's a born uh, born in Saudi. That guy. Yeah. And his mask that he's wearing is a piece of the ghutra, yeah. of the male ghutra. The this ghutra is the Saudi headpiece. The Saudi uh, garb. Yeah, the, the thing, the traditional religion thing that the men wear, he cut the edge of it. This is our transportation minister in Canada. This is what he wears on his face as oh. he uh, controls the Canadian transportation. Just wanted oh. everyone to see that. 
Yeah, yeah. The, I mean, that's that's kind of mind boggling to me because I'm, like stuff like that just does not happen in the UK. But I've been watching your videos and I'm starting to understand that the situation in Canada is a whole lot different. What is it like where you're at now? Do you do you is is it like do you know is it as bad? Like this um, is how bad it is in Canada right now, and half the country is not aware. Wow, that is uh, that's honestly it's crazy because when I think of Canada, I don't I don't think of the you know the creeping Islamization of it. Like in the UK, we've been having this discussion for a while, at least since I was at university as well. Like this concept of creeping Sharia and how much it's infiltrating into like actual Western society, and now we have fully fledged like Sharia councils and courts operating in the UK. So you can totally bypass UK law and opt for Sharia. Um, to determine like marriage, divorce, child, child, child custody. Why any woman would want to go to a Sharia council as opposed to rely on the secular law, I have no idea. But um, I, tactic, I mean, the the tactic cockroaches like the transportation minister in Canada with his muzzle from Saudi. The tactic yeah. they use to enter countries and infiltrate these countries to end up with you're saying it's called islamic entryism right islam as you know is a political movement it's not a religion exactly islam exactly disguises itself so he has entered canada and he's not the only one we have a few of these mm -hmm. uh the, the the tactic is called political islamic entryism and I, I think that's amazing yeah. that you talk, you brought that up because I feel like people don't talk about that enough. Like when I obviously got to grips with with like the tenets of Islam and realized how much of it is a political ideology. Like even the word for leaving is called like ibtidat in Arabic, right? That's akin to treason, treason yeah. and sedition, which just yeah. goes to show like that's a moderate Islam anyway. By the way, that's not even like the Wahhabi interpretation of it, but. That just goes to show you, and and this is happening in the West, like low key, and what you're talking about is a very real phenomenon. It is, it is, and people need to start waking up, regardless where you are, because if it's happened in the big countries, I can guarantee you it's going to happen in the smaller ones. I'm not yeah. trying to scare anybody, but it's time. It's time to wake up, and it's time to listen to women like us, because we we don't come on here. For attention, we yeah. we are not seeking. Are you contrary seeking? to what people think? We're literally not doing this for attention. We have no, we could be doing not. so much more with our lives right now. <laughs> oh, listen, I, I uh, pfft, honey, You're a busy woman. <laughs> I'm telling you, Iman is a busy woman. Like this is not something that <laughs> it's so important to talk about these, especially these personalized experiences in in a country where. You know, most people just write Saudi off as being one way or the other, but we're giving you actual lived experiences um, from two different perspectives and you can see where it kind of intertwines. And I, I wanted to bring this up later on, like one answer after we've kind of gone through the conversation, but yes. it's just already come up in the comments. So I'm going to touch on this now. Obviously, Absolutely. you've seen what Mohammed bin Salman is doing in Saudi and you can see like, even when I lived there back in the day, like Jeddah is still considered one of the more liberal cities, like Dahran, Damam that's considered even more liberal, but they were trying to like segregate parts of the city where they're like, okay, here we will lax the Abaya rules and here women can potentially drive. This is before, you know, they legalize driving. But what do you, I just, as a, as a Saudi yourself, as somebody who lived there, what are you, what's your interpretation of what MBS is doing for Saudi and the kind of I love opening it. up and I love yes, it. He's I think up the filth. <laughs> He's, I thought you'd say that. <laughs> He's good. Listen, Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia. Is he gonna yeah. go in a humanitarian way to clean it up? No, no. Mm -hmm. But when was Saudi Arabia humanitarian? Never. Yeah. So we <laughs> clear the trash, and once the trash is cleared, then we can become more humanitarian. The trash cannot be cleared in a humanitarian manner. The yeah. trash, the the Wahhabis, the Muslim Brotherhood, all that. Mohammed bin Salman is doing. The right thing. Mm -hmm. That's the way I see it. Is it harsh? 100%. But that's a harsh part of the world. 
Yeah, so, definitely. And I mean, the only reason I've like, for example, even I mean, the fact that my family stayed out there so long is because you're kind of sold this whole dream of like, oh, it's a tax free. It's not even just a tax free haven. It's like you will get it's a hardship zone. So if you're if you're recruited by certain companies, you are getting a very privileged lifestyle. You're getting like, you know, business first class paid tickets just for you to live there and have yeah. your children go to the best schools but we will also get you out on like business class first class three times a year to your home country and that's honestly what the incentive was otherwise when we were thinking of moving from england to saudi wow even nine year old me was like dad it's just desert like what are we gonna do like you had no concept of it but as a Muslim, the own the biggest call was, oh, we're so blessed because we're so close to Mecca and Medina wow. and the Umrahs and the Hajjs you can do, which people save up their whole life to do. We can kind of do it <laughs> on the weekend. We can do it after school and then come back to the nice compound where everything is like mini yeah. America again. Yeah, let's go pray to God and then come back. And uh, I don't even know the hypocrisy. I swear it's it's. Saudi Arabia at that point in time had to bring in the expats and the only way it could bring it bring them in is with money because uh -huh. there was no freedom in that country so they did bring them in I don't know if you're aware of William Sampson have you heard of him no no anyway he's just someone he was an expat from uh, Britain and Canada that was in Saudi he was arrested the same time I was arrested same yeah. jail we circulated through he wrote a book it's called Confessions of an Innocent Man. Oh, uh, you wow. should probably, yeah, you should probably look into it. And uh, yeah, no, I. It's uh, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of interesting things going on right now in the Middle East. There's a lot of change. Yeah. Uh, I believe it will be for the good. I believe it is for the good. It might, on its surface, look ugly. The change that's happening right now. But once it's done, I think you will see the progress amazing, unlike what the West is doing to itself. Yeah, yeah. And and obviously they potentially you can give some of them the benefit of the doubt. Like, honestly, I'm, I'm trying to be a lot more vocal with like even the UK stance because I feel like they really backpedal when it comes to confronting like Islamism or even this political Islam that's seeping yeah. in from such a grassroots level that they don't understand it. If they, you have oh, Tom, wow. Tom Quiggin wrote this yeah. book. It's called Submission, The Danger of Political Islam to Canada with a warning to America. This is the book. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm just, that's all okay. right. Plug the book. Yeah. It's important. Yeah. This is an important topic. Sorry. Didn't mean to cut you off, my dear. Continue. Yeah, no, 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 that, that's, that's so okay. Because yeah, I think Canada is facing something which again, most people are just completely unaware of, especially people from outside. We, we just, think of Canada as like this kind of free open country Canada takes a lot more migrants than other countries and you just yeah obviously the ramifications of that are always like you know you, you have no idea what you're letting in that's what people were arguing was happening in Germany's case for example just letting in so many Muslim migrants and how that would affect like the demographics and the social fabric of the country but again I the same thing in England and I feel like it's our voices are so important because we're telling you we have a lived experience and we know the yeah. threat that this religion poses. Um, and so when these politicians are gaining more power, it's yeah. like, are they, what's what's their ulterior motive? What's the hidden agenda behind just what you see? And like, I'm, I'm shook that this was, you're saying he's actually a political yeah. um, person and wearing that mask on that. That's a, such a massive statement to make. That's and that's just the surface. There's a lot going on underneath that. Unfortunately, I just cannot disclose right disclose right now. Yeah. But the problem that I guess if you want to think of it as a cancer, the cancer now has spread everywhere. Yeah. Globally, the cancer has seeds everywhere. Extracting it is going to be some interesting thing. Yeah. And, and, and that's why you speaking up on this, you kind of keep like giving insights, pushing for this to be recognized. And I just I want to backtrack a little bit because I want just to go back to our story some more and also just focus on 
your qualifications Absolutely. and what you're doing now and why your voice is so important and why it can't be dismissed outright. So yeah, can you just tell us a little bit more about what happened to you in Saudi and your your how you moved to the West and what you're qualified as, just lay it all out. <laughs> so I'm a physician, by the way. I don't know if you guys know. Uh, I don't say it enough, clearly. I was trained in Saudi Arabia as a medical doctor. And that was my way out of Saudi Arabia. That's how I came to Canada as a physician. Uh, now, eventually, I, I got myself into a lot of trouble <laughs> in Saudi Arabia uh, because I wasn't protected, right? I didn't live in a protected area. And my family uh, felt that I was uh, harming, uh, muddying the name of the family with my actions. Uh, they reached up. I was jailed a few times, you know, boys, not boys, covering your face, not covering your face. But then the big one came after a night shift at the hospital where my stepmother refused to send the, the driver to come pick me up. And I, uh, women couldn't drive. So uh, my male colleague who was on call with me drove me home. Mm -hmm. that was the end. already that's already dangerous right like this is so <laughs> minor but this is a thing where you could honestly be done for in saudi arabia yeah. which is just yeah. mind-boggling yeah so exactly they i we were stopped we were abducted uh four gmcs we were driving on the highway four gmcs surrounded us two one in the Holy front the back, <laughs> one on each side and I they think your experience would trigger me a bit like, oh, God, OK. <laughs> I didn't even know what was going on. I was like, what? What? And uh, yeah, before you know it, the doors were opening. They were pulling him. He was being beat. I was being uh, ordered. They didn't never touched me. They just ordered me to uh, exit the vehicle like a, you know, like a contagion. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And demanded to show, you know, what is he to you? What are you to him? And I didn't have my papers because he was nothing to me. And that's when they, you know, you're a whore. Of course, you're a doctor. And uh, yeah, they took me yeah. to an undisclosed location where I was hidden for three days. No food, no water, nothing. Oh. God, and then one of those life... like desert prisons that you hear about, which are just in some yep. undisclosed location, and yep. yeah, there's no con oh, interrogated, gosh. heavily interrogated, uh, not allowed to sleep, not allowed to rest. They would barge in the room at any point, and if my face wasn't covered, they would start hammering, yelling to cover your face. At some point, one guy ran at me to, to hit me, and it was just, it was just unbelievable. They made me sign four pages empty, white, white. Mm -hmm. They can just place any charges they like there. Yep, this is, oh God. Yeah. And then uh, next thing I knew, I was in a women, the Dar al Riaya. Dar al Riaya, uh, women's uh, girls pre uh, correctional facility. Mm -hmm. I was there for three months. And uh, uh, finally my dad came and got, I, I don't even want to tell you what happened to me in there. But yeah. finally, my dad came and got me out. And when he did, I uh, thought I was free. And then two weeks down the road, I was called in to come get my 80 lashes in public. <laughs> oh. So uh, that, was, that was, I never got them. Because at that point, my father disowned me. And my mm -hmm. brother took over. And my brother went to the prince of Riyadh lied to the prince and told him that I had been married off to a man and that that man did not know anything about my story and that the they had to pardon me because get this because if I was to be flogged then my husband would divorce me and that oh. is why I was pardoned oh my god I was pardoned this pardon is <laughs> Oh, I just, I'm sorry. I just, that was, that's so heavy. That's like, I, I, yeah, that's Saudi Arabia. And now you know why I get pissed when I see a piece of cockroach, like our transportation minister wearing his Saudi whatever in Canada. Yeah. yeah. And, and honestly, like, I mean, I cannot commend your bravery, like, <laughs> enough at all like no matter what I just I'm not usually lost for words I can say but I'm the same about you my dear you're the same no 
No, 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 no. I mean, I've like, not, not on this level. I just don't think I could have endured what you had to go through. Even just what? tell me what was the worst experience you what made you what made you decide to leave? What was it? I think, again, it's just so similar in the sense that it was like when you realize, okay, my they are actually now, whether it's the police or these men or the Islamic police, whether they're using like a Sharia law, but they are trying to snatch away your freedom and put you in, in Dubai. We have similar prisons out in the desert. When they are trying to get you there, come hell or high water, they will make you sign a document in Arabic almost yes. Uh, completely like giving up anything they can add whatever they want they're literally typing as they please and they're like yalla sign and I'm yeah. like wait wait where's my lawyer translate this to me in English what am I signing and again when that just when that harassment gets to such a point where you're like now like shit's gonna hit the fan like I would be lost I would be in some prison I would need international attention to you know shed light on my case and there's only so much that like, you know, pleading with the, the highest police chief or the court people or my father trying to step in. There's only so much that could happen that would actually ensure my safety. So that's when thankfully my passport came in handy. And like I made one call to the embassy and the guy Good. was just like, I mean, yeah, that was my honesty. That was my last. And I was about I, I had lost hope. I was like, let me just give these guys what they want. Like surely they cannot put these charges on me these are crazy charges how are no, you they can and they, they can, can. <laughs> they can yeah. i'm in my father's house like very similar to you in the, but just the fact that your dad disowned you just before i was in my father's house but he was out of the country and four yeah. policemen showed up to arrest me on like these charges and you know when you've just you're so defeated like every single night i was Honestly, I'd call friends over. I would sit there and because they would they would hound me at 10 p.m., 11 p.m. They'd come knocking at my door. They'd be looking into my room window. They would have people stalking me. And it's like one slip up. They're waiting for one yeah. tiny slip up. Yeah. And to it's get so me. easy to do that. Yeah. And, and even meeting a male friend is slip up enough. You know, it's like, boom, adultery, boom, this, boom, anything. Absolutely. And they will end your existence over nothing. <laughs> nothing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So Please. honestly, I literally just, I'm um, sorry, there's like so many comments coming in as well from when you were telling your story. I feel like people are just absolutely shook. Like, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, everyone's like, no, okay, like some of these comments were just, yeah, con congratulations for connecting. I feel like this was, this was, uh, it's, it's, it's a long time overdue considering we have so it much is. to talk about. It is. No, and this, hopefully we will be doing more. There will be more. I feel definitely. it. Definitely, definitely, yeah. definitely. And honestly, just hearing your backstory as well makes me understand why you are so passionate when you do speak out about these things that matter to you and the fact that, like, it's who has had an experience like that? Where we hear some random cases in the media, you know, like Rahaf, I heard you also speak out on behalf of her and I could sense the, pa like, it's only when you go through a, a something where your freedom is literally going to be taken and you know how hard it's going to come down on you that you can empathize with all the other women who are A, trying to get out or still stuck there. And whether they think they're happy or whether they deep down want to escape, you know, like, like Saudi Arabia, for example, I could not believe uh, first of all, the, the guardian, the Wali system, yep. but there's a whole system of guardianship. Yep. Uh, you cannot travel. You cannot do anything without the permission of a male member, whether it's if it's not your dad, if it's your grandfather, brother. your brother, your, it could be your yep. mom's brother before you. Yep. Like absolutely anyone. They just agency is not given to women at all. I remember even in the UAE, it was so demeaning, like uh, me wanting to get a job, I'd need a non-objection certificate from my ex-husband. And I was like, really, you have to write on a piece of paper that you don't object to me working, That's, which is only <laughs> gonna benefit us anyway. Like, I wow. And even then I'm a working professional, but they don't understand that concept of my visa. They put housewife just because I'm married and I was that age. Like they don't consider a woman to be just a free thinking, no integral contributing member of society which is wild it, it is uh, to them we are objects and that's the yeah. way it should be yeah 
And the oh. second you do something and you choose to live your life um, on yeah. your own terms, you are a genuine threat. You're a threat to your family. You're a threat to society. You're a threat to the community. Um, but yeah, okay, like these comments are just so, um, they're just so nice to hear. People mm -hmm. are really like resonating with these stories. Thank you all so much for your support and your love. It <laughs> helps us carry on. Um, but yeah, Iman, what else? Tell me, like, so now you've moved to the West. What was yeah. it like? Like, you obviously went through that situation. Were you were you a believing, like, Muslim even during that phase? Like, was it, I know, obviously, like, I mean, I've always been pretty liberal as well, you know, so yeah. I've always, my, my concept of what God was was always very much different. Like, I was like, I love my friends. Some of them drink, some of them are gay. But exactly. why is that? You know, I don't think my God that I know is not that, yeah uh even me for example i was like yeah if i have a cigarette or if i have a drink i'm not going to be doomed to hell because it's a personal thing like surely god can't condemn obviously it goes against islam but i had been such uh even like it's so ironic because saudi moving to saudi arabia for me before that i was nine years old living in england and i wore hijab and i was repping islam at school i moved to the the house of god <laughs> 40 minutes from the house of God and it all came crashing down. I was like, oh, I don't really feel like I'm that connected or need to be. So how was it for you in terms of your religiosity throughout living there and then leaving it behind and moving away? I uh, I keep telling here in, in, in Canada, there's a fascination with Islam. Uh -huh. I, I think there's a fascination with Islam in most of the West. Yeah. Uh, and they like this word Islamophobia. They, they love this word. So uh, the people that are fascinated with Islam and they truly believe that it is a religion of peace and they love it and uh, it's, uh, you should live by it. I highly recommend to move to an Islamic country <laughs> yeah. and, and go live there. It's nice to live in a liberal society and promote Islam. It's very nice, you know, because you can practice whichever Islam you want. You know, the true Islam, the not very true Islam, the, the you know, the whatever. It's all fine and dandy here. But when you go to our part of the world, it changes. The story yeah. becomes a little bit different. Yeah. And, and honestly, like, this is not, again, just, oh, we've had, like, two bad experiences and therefore we are hating on this country or that part of the world. Like, I mean, I was so interested in all of these, like, I mean, even even from the royals themselves, like, look at their own women, look at books that they've published. I think it's called Daughters of Arabia is one of them. Uh, there's a whole, like, um, I think there's a whole sequel and there's, a, yeah, there's a bit of a collection there. But this this royal family member is reaching out to um uh, somebody to write under a pseudonym and just like detail the exploitation and the subjugation of their own women these are their own flesh and blood mm -hmm. and the, the way that they are treated and it's the same thing that i always in my whenever i get the chance i bang on about the case of uh sheikha shamsa and sheikha latifa from the yeah. uae as well who were essentially kidnapped by their own father um probably yeah, Prob probably killed. I know Sheikha Shamsa is like pretty much in a vegetative state. She's being fed like heavily medicated constantly. There's physicians watching and noting down her every move. And it's been like this for years now. And Latifa, I mean, the UN even now keeps pressing and saying we need proof of life. We need proof of life. And you get these really shady looking pictures where a body language expert or somebody who understands like, you know, the human psychology and body life is like she's not OK. But yet the world and the West just has to be like, OK, we've you've given us just enough for us to back off because these are heads of state that we're talking about. And uh, it's not like if you look at how they treat the royal women, imagine how they're treating the non-royal. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Oh. And, and again, there's so many layers to this, and I'm sure, like, the more we chat, the more we'll uncover it. But again, like, living in Saudi Arabia, the the concept of like these agencies where they bring over like home help and maids, and they're essentially forced into sex labor, and um, and the, like that's what I was saying, you know, because I was thankfully lucky enough to live in a compound, but I would see these these villas, and I'd see the four identical portions, and you know exactly what's happening there. But then you'd hear stories, and you'd hear like of like also like droves of maids locked up in their gardens and sheds and things like that like this is not some fact this is like a dark reality of what actually happens there 
Uh, listen, our part of the world is a very dark part of the world. When wow. the West started bringing in third world immigrants, I, I'm like, why? Why are you, why? You have a very nice thing going <laughs> for you here. You can bring in immigrants, but bring in the immigrants that are deserving. Yeah. But uh, unfortunately, Totally. Like, like Rahaf's situation, for example, I know so many people in Saudi and the UAE who absolutely bought into the whole conspiracy that, you know, she's just done this to rebel and give Saudi no. a bad name no. and all of this nonsense. Why, why would any woman, why would you, a young, beautiful, educated woman, do any of this? Who yeah. does this? Exactly. Why? <laughs> who, who literally sticks their neck out just to claim their life back. No. Unless we were truly being harmed. Yeah. I think the fact that we succeed in escaping and we have all these horror stories behind us, people can't believe it because people in the West, for the most part, have nice lives. For the most part, it's safe. You know, the big scary stories, usually you hear about them in the news, that there's a big uh, case and maybe a documentary. You don't see women on YouTube talking about their horrific stories, but you don't see them on YouTube talking about their horrific stories because someone has already listened to them and acknowledged their stories. The ex-Muslim woman, till this moment, no one's listening to her. Show me one public figure that right now is saying, other than Do uh, Donald Trump, by the way, <laughs> who I love uh, and have a lot of respect for, other than Donald Trump, who has brought women from our part of the world in front of the world to show them their story? Has right. anyone? No. Has anyone? Not at all. And that's actually a great point because I was just le actually going to lead up to that question and ask you, I mean, the, the things that you go through and the things that you experience there just as a woman, like the, the way you were treated, right? Like even on a daily basis and then let alone when the time when you're actually confronted with authority and you're you're like what like am I literally just uh, like scum to them pretty much like I'm so I'm so I'm such scum but I'm also such a threat at the same time it's it's mind-boggling but for me as well for a long time because you internalize that to such an extent even moving away from the UAE it took me a long time to actually like have the guts to be like can I take on this entire country can I come out here on like in front of the world and, and talk about the realities and go and talk about you know what the sheikh is doing to his own family can i can i touch on the saudi royal family like do i and did you feel the same thing like what did you did you have to really gear yourself up to you know finally come out and speak about it or were you just so like burning with passion to when you came out that you were like i just need to tell my story i when i escaped saudi arabia the first thing i did when i came to canada was i wrote my blog it was it's called time for me to talk oh that's God. the first it's so similar as well i literally yeah. wrote a vlog as soon as i got to the uk it was yeah. So yeah are we twins I think <laughs> definitely soul system <laughs> <laughs> but what's it was the name so of your weird. blog it's um noriacan.com but you can just see me okay. being like women don't owe men shit and like i'm just <laughs> venting and i'm like trying to come to terms with everything and i'm like what but it was so therapeutic um so it that is. was a great move exactly so making a youtube channel comes natural it's just yeah. it's the next natural step right yeah and uh, yeah. so, and then we unite and we find each other and we create a movement because we don't need external people for to hear our voice. Mm -hmm. We have a voice and we have a community. So thank you. Yeah, right back at you. Honestly, this this conversation is just already so wholesome. I'm like, it's already 43 <laughs> minutes. We have so much to cover. But we have got some super chats. So thank you so much to Greg. Greg is saying this misplaced fascination can be diminished if they are actually shown what Quran and Hadith say so they can exactly see what Islam entails. Yeah. See, that's the thing. Like a lot of people, this is the problem, don't know what it, the reality is that it entails. And especially in a country like Saudi Arabia that we're talking about, 
I used to think, okay, this is just the crazy, most Wahhabi form <laughs> and implementation of, of Islam. Like, I never thought that, that the authority and the Saudi ulema, their interpretation of Islam was my Islam, but they know what they're doing and they know how to politicize and weaponize Islam to keep, like, what, what are we talking about? Women just got the right to drive a couple of years ago. The woman that fought for the right for women to drive is still locked yeah. up. Yeah. yeah, he's in jail. It, it's just, it's so mind-blowing. There's me, still but... a lot of cleaning up to do. That woman, by the way, there are some links to the Muslim Brotherhood. There are right. some things that are not coming to the surface. The Middle East right now, Saudi Arabia has a lot of enemies, okay? Mm -hmm. I was one of the people up until two years ago when women began to drive. You couldn't get me to say Saudi Arabia is changing. I refuse that. I would not yeah. ever believe that. But watching what has happened and transpired and watching what's going on in Canada has proven to me that Saudi Arabia has changed because Canada has turned its back on Saudi Arabia. Up until the point that Saudi Arabia was a full-blown Islamic Wahhabi terrorist sponsoring dictatorship, Canada loved it. Yeah. Canada, you know, it couldn't separate it from Saudi Arabia. All the students were coming here. And then suddenly, things changed. And now Canada is actually quite hostile towards MBS, specifically MBS, Mohammed bin Salman, because of the changes that he's implementing. But that's a different story. Yeah. Don't worry about that right now. Yeah, because we, we need a whole session to dissect. My dear, we there. need a, like a movie, you and I. <laughs> <laughs> we definitely do. Oh my gosh. And um, oh, Horace Sultan sent a super chat as well. Thank you so much. He's saying, so nice to see ex Muslim women sharing their experience. Hi, Doc. Now we have an ex Muslim medical doctor. <laughs> I've not an episode where you guys tell me your medical problems. <laughs> I just can't believe you not you've not made one mocking Zakir Naik um by oh, now because he claims oh, to be this. But oh. <laughs> one you and I, we need to just do one time, just mock all of them. Honestly. Every single one of them. They will put a fatwa <laughs> <laughs> they will. on us both. <laughs> Listen, we've we've dealt with like the worst of the worst. Bring on your fatwas while we're kind of, we're, we're, we're much better off now. <laughs> we've learned Sorry. the hard way. Can you can handle a fatwa, Iman? Honey, I can handle two fatwas. <laughs> bring it. <laughs> yalla, let's have some fatwas. Yalla, yalla, bring it. No, because nothing's going to start. I mean, like you said, it only comes natural that, you know, you have a story to tell. Maybe you start by blogging. Maybe you, it's when you like, you know, you start to really appreciate and then use your freedom as a platform because you're like, holy shit, like, how can I stay quiet <laughs> on these matters? Especially like you're saying, like, even I'm not sure how many parallels there are between Canada and the UK, but I see like these Muslim women in the UK and they, they claim to be so free and so liberated and they're just, their views are so vastly different. And I'm like, do you understand how lucky you are to be living in the West and saying what you're saying? Because if mm -hmm. I take you for a tour of Saudi for like a day and you see a, a day in the life of a woman in Saudi, one of those villas, completely out in the middle of nowhere as one of four compartments answering to that one husband getting an noc non-objection certificate to go absolutely anywhere it's demeaning you're stopped at the airport as an adult woman being like where's your father's permission for you to go to dubai whereas you you have nothing you have nothing no, you going for you. and they treat you like you're a criminal it's not yeah. just it's not just you don't have the right you're a criminal yeah. How dare you? As Greta Thunberg would say, how dare you? How dare you? Exactly. They you know? Actually, yeah. And and I think even now, like MBS is trying to, I guess he's trying to give more freedom to to women in the sense that, you know, he's he's loosening. We can have a whole other discussion on this, but he's trying to loosen the, the concept of guardianship. And he's like, you can travel abroad now. You don't need a mehram and you don't need a, a male's permission. Good. Which, yeah, and the other, and yesterday I think I saw one of the first, like Pitbull's concert took place in maybe it was Riyadh or some other city, and you just saw men and they were like there with like waving um, stuff around, and it was so, again all men only, 
but it was such a sight to behold. I'm like, okay. It has to come in baby steps. Yeah. You can't just open up the society. They're going to rape women. Literally, you have yeah. to do it in baby steps. This is an extremely oppressive society. Yeah. And it's been oppressive for decades. Yeah. So the opening up has to come in baby steps, right? I bet, and you and I also know this is like the opening up for the average person because, I mean, even like you said, right, in Saudi, if I had stayed longer as well, yeah. there are ways where you can get everything you want. And these yeah. men are living their best lives. You do yeah. not understand what goes down at these house parties. And I mean, they have absolutely everything. They have things you can't even dream about getting in the West and they have them flown in, dropped at their villas. Yeah. It's a whole different scene for them. So they're not making any personal sacrifices or changes on their part. They are just making other really? people's lives marginally better. And the punishments are so different for men than they are for women vastly different mm -hmm. you know good luck as a woman going to uh, telling anyone you were raped good yeah. luck yeah exactly exactly so, it's just not you you actually i, I mean I, I think i mentioned this briefly on apostate prophets channel as well but it was so i, I would think i was like maybe 15 at the time one of my teachers because i went to a very international school one of yeah. my teachers actually was raped so she was she was like a westerner and she had got into a taxi which again you should never really do in saudi arabia as a woman she he drove her out into the middle of the desert raped her and left her there to basically die um she made it back thankfully but I have never seen a woman, and I think you said this in one of your videos, and it literally struck like a chord in my heart because I think you were talking about um, some man that, that tried to uh, harass a, a woman or something because she wasn't wearing an abaya, and you said, if, if that didn't kill her, she's dead inside anyway. And this, the sentiments I saw of my art teacher, this bubbly vocal, this woman with zest for life, literally walk into school, almost like the human equivalent of like her tail between her legs, looking down. She couldn't look anyone in the eye. She literally came into school, packed her belongings and just got out of the country. Forget justice, forget going to seek any, no. any help from any authorities, anything that she just realized this is the only thing I can do to save myself is just get the hell out of there. And that guy is still out there and he forever will get away with this. Of course. You, you, you'll be happy to know that the man who assaulted me sexually in Canada in a hospital was Saudi. And the hospital removed me and kept him. <sighs> oh, my God. Oh, my in God. Canada. In Canada. In Canada. Yes. Oh, yes. my gosh. Not only this. The case went to court and there is a warrant out for his arrest. Not okay. only that, he's, there's a warrant out for his arrest and he's still working as a physician in Saudi Arabia. Oh my. But I'm the one who, yeah. Anyway. It, I'm so sorry that you've honestly yeah, had to go through listen, so I'm much, listen. but I just look at you and all I see is like power. So I'm like, no, this is, what you can kill you makes you stronger. I guess you it, were literally it, it, living embodiment uh, of that. That is 100%. Look at you. Look at you. You're such a strong woman. Yeah. You must be so proud of yourself. Yeah, well, it's when I talk to other women like you, and I, you know, like, it's almost like your own experience is kind of validated. I, I, I don't mean to, to diminish either of our experiences, but sometimes I'm like, oh, I have a bit of imposter syndrome because I'm like, okay, that shit happened. Like, do I get over it? But then I talk to you and I'm like, no, what we went through was actually so Something. real and so, yeah. And it's and not it's victimhood. Moment. We're not here crying, oh, look what the, they did to me. <laughs> That's not what we're doing. Yeah. I raise awareness for the other women who are yeah. still there, trapped. They can't get out. You and I were lucky. That's exactly. I think actually that's when I fell in love with your channel as well, when you were like, I'm here to speak when you can't, because that's the whole premise of my platform as well. Like, exactly. I'm, yeah. And, and even for women who don't know why we're speaking, like women that will shit all over us now and think that we're, you know, bad mouthing Islam or whatever. I'm like, even somewhere, somewhere along the line, we're fighting for you for to you realize, too. yeah, you don't even know it, but maybe one day the light bulb will click on it, or the, the penny will drop. It might, it might at some point click. Let's hope. Yeah. Because yeah. what we're doing is we're trying to save the women of the West 
from the, the shit show that's headed down the chute if all of this doesn't stop soon. So hopefully our voices will, yeah. Five minutes, okay, sorry. We gotta finish in five minutes, sorry. Okay, jokes. Uh, just cover this um, super chat from Russell. Thank you so much for your support. You are honestly like, your support means the world. You're constantly <laughs> like, you're supporting all the videos that come out. You're always around, so thank you so much. And he's saying, thank you both for speaking out. Your voices are so important. And I could not agree more. Like, Iman, thank you so much for sharing no, your story you. as well. And I apologize about the lighting and everything. It's not my ideal situation. Girl, we're here for what you have to say. And you that's coming across crystal clear. And you look banging as a side note. <laughs> I'm so hot as well. I'm like, is this, is this the, the anxiety <laughs> from what we're talking about? Because I'm like, well, I'm sweating. <laughs> I'm so you. Thank you so much for your super sticker i really really appreciate it and um i hope you feel better soon because we spoke earlier um and next time please please you're more than welcome to jump on and get involved in this conversation because the more voices that we have the better um and oh my gosh there's just so many there's so many positive um comments that i i don't know what to pull up in the next four minutes but yeah. <laughs> okay i'm gonna leave it to you is there anything you because you've shed light on what's happening in canada and yeah. a lot of your channel revolves around those topics which i think are very important um and again you're because again I, I struggle to know your actual story so today i'm kind of like more mind blown now i have the backstory and now i understand what you're saying, I understand the threat that you're seeing in Canada now where you're, you know, you're meant to feel completely different. It's meant to be in a whole different situation. Yet here you are still fighting off Islam, whether it's political or Islamism or in the form of like migrants or political policies. Um, so I just kind of want to give you a minute or two to say anything you'd like to say, wrap it up, and then we can we can shoot off. But honestly, the love in this chat today is real. <laughs> Well, listen, I'm just very happy to have connected with you. And I'm so happy that you are here. And I'm so happy that you are doing this. I'm just happy. <laughs> okay. I'm just very happy. Thank you. Yeah, I know. I'm so glad. I feel like if I believed in a God, I would say that this is God. God made us connect yeah. because it is yeah. crazy. Like I literally, honestly, guys and girls, I just fully spoke to Iman for like five minutes before we came on this live <laughs> and we were like oh my god like our stories have mad parallels and we've got so many topics like offshoots of this where we can go into just our lives in Saudi just like what we dealt with the authorities the freaking prison sentence and now living in the west and still trying to kind of expose and fight off what's happening and then you've got insane nuances with the Canadian political situation which I think are immensely beneficial and i think i mean i would just learn learn love to learn from you because i think england needs to wake up and realize that this is knocking on their door as well it is and nobody is is willing to to say that out loud i mean no no white man no white christians no white liberals are willing to say that again like you mentioned earlier the fear of the word islamophobia equating islam and racism there's <laughs> no expectations from the West. All of these things are there to silence you, but yet here we are and we're saying, no, this is a real threat and you guys need to wake up before it's too late. Thank you. Thank yeah. you for your voice. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for being here. Um, I know you were traveling today, so I really appreciate it. And yeah, let's do this again soon. We will. I'm gonna touch base with you next week. We're gonna do this. Awesome, awesome. I cannot wait. Thank, thank you to everybody who was watching and tuned in. Um, sorry if it got a bit heavy in the middle, but that's just us and our story exactly. is part and parcel of why we're here and how we got to where we are. Um, but yeah, light and love to everybody. Iman, thank you so much and enjoy the rest of your day. This was awesome. You too. Peace out. Bye. Peace out, Bye. everyone. <laughs>